chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Verses 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Father, if it is all possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not tarry with me for one hour? Keep watching and pray that you may not enter into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus went away again a second time and prayed, saying, Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? For behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going, for behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Lord Jesus, let's just lift up our hands to the Lord right now. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all that you're doing in our midst. We thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us. Holy Spirit, teach us. In this hour, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to have a heart of intercession. Teach us to be strong in the spirit and that our flesh wouldn't dictate to us when you call for us to pray. Lord, in this hour, I know you're raising up the body of Christ, Lord, and you're raising up this powerful ministry of prayer in this hour to call on to the Lord, to hear from God, and to make intercession. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title of my message today is, Can You Pray With Me For One Hour? And we're going to be talking about the power of corporate prayer. Now, disclaimer right off the bat, prayer is a huge subject throughout Scripture, right? There is no possible way to cover it, cover it in one short message, it's or be an exhaustive teaching in it. So what I'm doing today is we're going to take the 50,000 foot view and I'm going to point out that some of the biggies of what the Bible has to say and especially to get our focus on corporate prayer. So uh, it is one of the most essential spiritual practices and disciplines that God requires of us, especially for, you know, for us as believers and the scriptures literally talk about pray, prayer, or praying hundreds of times between the Old and the New Testament. So prayer is a form of spiritual communion and communication between us and God. Now, here's the thing. People of every religion pray. So prayer in of itself is not exclusively Christian. It's exclusively human. And it's exclusively part of our design. Now, the, the thing is, is what are you praying to or whom are you praying to is what is most important, right? So, for the believer in Christ, that's you and I, prayer must always be combined with faith in order to receive the full benefits of this practice. Amen? So, I want to define for you, first of all, what prayer is biblically, because it's easy to say pray, and we have these assumptions, but it's good to kind of lift up the hood of the engine, like Sean likes to do, and tinker around a little bit with the intricacies of this uh, eight-cylinder diesel that we have called prayer. So in the New Testament, Larry knows about that, that big truck outside. In the New Testament, <laughs> see, I got the EV motor now, that EV turbo power, so my prayer life is a little bit different. 
It's got the recharger in it too, so I don't have to plug it in. So in the New Testament, prayer appears primarily as the Greek word prosyokomahi. Prosyokomahi, which simply means a simple definition is to pray. It's made up of two uh, Greek words, which you'll see find very typical of these verbs. Uh, pros means towards or to exchange, combined with uh, yokomahi, which means to wish or to pray. So proper the proper usage is to exchange wishes, right? To pray, or in, or literally, it means to. In, in our case, for the believers, from the scriptural point of view, it means to interact with the Lord by switching human wishes or ideas for His wishes as He imparts faith, right? And we're going to walk through kind of the process today. So it's literally switching our wishes, our desires, our needs, our ideas. So you start out on the plane of, of the human of humanity, right? And as we interact with the Lord of, in, in prayer, for Christians, there's an exchange taking place. And unfortunately for us, God sometimes doesn't like our ideas and our wishes. <laughs> We're going to get to that. So praying is closely interconnected to faith. Faith and prayer temper one another. You cannot separate the two. For, for the Christian, Faith in Jesus Christ, right, in the gospel, is, predicates, and tempers your prayer life. Amen? So, there are two sources of prayer, as you can see, right in the definition, kind of hints at this, right? There's the prayer that starts on the carnal side. We have something happen and say, oh God, why me? I never kicked an old lady, right? And we say, Oh God, I can't do this. Why is this happening to me? Lord, this is bad. So we're starting out in our natural plan. And it's not evil per se. It's just our human side. I don't mean it in a negative way. God accepts that prayer. He'll say, yep, I got you, Sean. Let it out. Right? Wine away. Get it all out. Right? Now he wants to take you a place of being spirit-led, where the exchange takes place. So, when you start out, oh God, I can't do this, and you go to, though this trial is difficult, Lord, I can do all things through the strength that you provide. Now you're getting into the spirit. Now you're starting to pray in faith, because you're combining it with scriptural truth, and you are what's called in the spirit. And we're going to take Take a look at that. Now, remember, God accepts both, right? God accepts both. But at the same time, He likes it when you go deeper into the Spirit and you start praying from faith. And that, my friends, is where you start to hear God in the midst of your prayer. Now, we had quite an experience on Wednesday night. I think there was, there was a, a, just a handful of us, like eight or nine people, and we started out, you know, specifically a lot of this is because of Brian, and that's a gift that this has given us to the church. As we begin to intercede for Brian, and I had just visited with Brian, I went to Tampa the day before, um, Larry and I, and Brian had some specific prayer requests in this time. And so, you know, I, I talked with him, how, how, how can we pray for you, like, exactly? Because sometimes you need specifics. Mm -hmm. Amen? Sometimes specifics are really important. Pay attention to that. And so, as I begin the meeting, the prayer meeting, we begin to talk about, you know, our update on Ryan, and there's definitely other needs as well. Of course, he's not the only one with needs. We, we don't want to ignore that. And we're starting out to pray, like, bless the doctors, bless Brian, help him through his chemo, you know, yeah. And all of a sudden, about 45 minutes in, there was a shift. I hate to use the atmosphere because it's very kind of costly, but it is kind of, there was a shift. And, you know, Charlotte just was overwhelmed in the spirit. She began to pray very powerfully. And all of a sudden it was like something changed in the room 
and everyone could hear God. They could sense Him. And we begin to pray in the Spirit. Not like the Pentecostals, yeah, blah, 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 blah. No. This was directed prayer by the Holy Spirit. And like, my gosh, we probably went through almost everybody in the church. And we just begin to pray. And God began to speak to our hearts. And the Lord dropped something in my heart at the same time, Dina. I said the scripture she had already pulled up three seats over that I had no idea. And it was just a powerful time. And I'm like, then the Lord brought another word on me why I'm here today. I was like, I had a sermon started, and it was like, download accepted. And now this is what you're getting today. Amen? Amen. I studied this out, of course, but the gist of this came in that powerful moment in the Spirit as God began to speak to you. How many of you have ever had God speak to you something where it's a whole bunch of things in like a very, in seconds, like a short period of time? Mm -hmm. You're just like, I got, wow. Now you got to like stop, take notes, figure it all out, look to your scriptures and whatnot. And so that's what happened. So first of all, praying in the Spirit is the prayer of faith. This, the two are really one. God has given us the ability and the provision to directly pray in a way He desires us to pray, and it moves Him into action. You know, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus modeled that prayer for us. Mm -hmm. On earth as it is in heaven. So God has a preferred will in every situation, but we have to catch up. And that's part of what prayer is about. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 6. He said, he was talking about, he was asking for prayer and talking about it. And he says this, with every prayer and request or supplication, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints. Now that's a sermon in itself right there, but I can't do that today, right? That's for another time. So the key phrase in this verse, en pneumati, or that's in the Greek, or in the English we translate it as in the spirit, en pneumati. So Paul uses two words, the word en, which means in, inside, within, or figuratively, in the realm or the sphere of, as in the condition or state in which something <laughs> operates from within or the inside. And then he uses the word pneuma or pneumati, which simply means spirit or wind or breath. And it's, it's the same meaning as the Hebrew counterpart in the Old Testament, Rauk, right? And the same range of meaning as pneuma. So it's interesting how the Hebrew and the Greek, God shows his consistency about the Spirit of God and being in the Spirit of God from Genesis, where we first see in Genesis 1, in 1 uh, verse 2, the Spirit of God moved over the waters, right? This type of language is used it has no bearing on the prayer itself, right? But it, it is an imperative, rather, to emphasize the source of prayer. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you pray in Japanese, Chinese, German, Italian, Portuguese, English. That doesn't matter. And a lot of uh, denominations in the church kind of bring in the spirit into with this their weird view of praying in tongues and that's not at all has nothing to do with that this is about the source of the prayer the source of the prayer is the holy spirit moving in you by faith and then you speaking out what is being birthed within you in your prayer everybody see that very important to understand that and get that right now there's two ways or two types in which we pray Right? There is individual prayers or personal prayers. 
Jesus was a good model of this when he would go alone into a secluded place to pray. Why? Because you need prayer time for yourself. Your first responsibility is to interact with your Creator for your own life. And no one else can do that for you, right? Like Jeff has a specific purpose. He's got Caroline and his family and his unique situation that he's responsible for. And he's, that's part of his life. And so Jeff has, needs time to pray for himself in his own situation and his own unique personality. Very important. But on the flip side of it, equally important, is corporate prayer. Corporate prayer is the joining of two or more believers together in the name of Christ for the purpose of intercession and supplication. And here's what your prayer content consists of. Intercession and supplication. So generally, intercession involves praying for others in their individual situations to produce a certain outcome that is in the will of God. The goal, hear me out here, the goal is always the will of God. So no matter what the situation you're going through, you've got to get with the Lord, whether it's individually or corporately, and we're saying, God, what is your specific will in this situation right now? Because this is where Scripture can only take you so far. Scripture doesn't say... When your assistant pastor comes down with leukemia, here's what to do. It doesn't say that. We have to seek God to get a living frame of word for right now with everything that's going on situationally in our lives. So we need both individual and importantly corporate prayer to take us from here to the will of God. And then supplication involves praying for individual or corporate needs. So it's simply known as requests. And God doesn't put a limit on it. He doesn't say, well, it's really selfish to pray that your bank account gets better. No. Or it's, you know, if you're praying for something that you desire, that's selfish. No. Whatever it is, you put the request before God, <clears throat> as the book of Hebrews says, come boldly to the throne of grace, and you put the need there. No matter what it is. It's part of the process. Christians think that they have to hide certain things from God. Well, that's too selfish of me to pray for that. So I'm not going to say it to you, God. Well, he already knows. Right? God already knows. He knows row six. He already knows. So pray it. Whatever it is, get it out. If you're feeling sad that day, pray it. If you're concerned for somebody, pray it. Whatever. Don't be shy. God loves it when you come to Him. Amen? There's no condemnation coming to God with anything. You're better off being honest. He already knows. He already knows. <laughs> Next, there's something required of you, as you saw in Ephesians 6, and we're going to take a look. <clears throat> Perseverance or persistence is required of you. God has made very clear that although every prayer is immediately heard, not every prayer has an immediate answer. Oftentimes, situations will dictate that we must persevere in our prayers or that a certain outcome in God's will takes time. Either way, God wants us to be persistent in our prayers. I have a feeling we're going to be praying for Brian and Denise for a long time. We're going to need persistence in this area, right? Just as an example. <laughs> Colossians 4 and 2. Paul says to devote yourselves to prayer. You hear that? Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So you, you don't come to God for a long time as a spoiled brat, right? Because he's going to bring a correction. You know, we come to God with the attitude of gratitude, right? That's for free. 
thankfulness. And he says, be alert in this. Be alert that you're being grateful and thankful and coming to God with the right attitude. We saw this in Luke 18 with the persistent widow, right? The persistent widow. She kept coming before the judge over and over and over and over. God loves that. Don't you think Jesus was saying something of the Father's heart in there? I think so. So the scriptures, here's the interesting thing. Scratchy, scratchy, here's at it again. It's a storm. Scratchy, scratchy. So the scripture offers no clear formula how to pray. Like, here's how you open up your prayer. This is exactly what... You ever see all the scripted prayers? I'm going to get into that in a minute. Don't do that stuff, right? Here's the generality of our, of our prayers. We pray humbly. Be humble before the Lord. Amen. If you start coming to Him with negative talk, He'll listen. And then He says, well, are you done yet? <laughs> Come to Him humbly. As we talk about, you pray in the Spirit. The goal is to get from your carnal to being Spirit-led. Three, pray with right motives. Be truthful, right? Is your motive self Ish or selfless. Don't offer repetitive prayers. Scripted prayers are generally not promoted in Scripture. And you have thousands of churches that read from these scriptive prayers over and each week. Get puts God to sleep. <laughs> Did you know that you can put God to sleep? Well, God gets bored, right? So, okay. Here we go again. No, he likes the hearts. And people use the Lord's Prayer as this repetitive prayer to just say over yourself as a magical uh, way to get out of a jam. That's not what it was. It was a model. It showcased the important aspects of prayer. Everything about prayer is in the Lord's Prayer. Humbleness. Gratefulness, the truth of God's word, re <clears throat> reflecting who God is, the desires for be for knowing heaven on earth, being in the spirit, reverence, love, faith, it's all in there as a model. We should always pray in faith. Amen? Mm -hmm. We are to be persistent and regular in prayer. So the model kind of goes like this. You acknowledge your prayer need. You get to a place where you're getting in, praying in the Spirit. You begin to intercede and make requests before the Lord. You then persevere in that. And you wait for God to speak because He's going to speak. Sometimes it's immediately. Sometimes it's tomorrow. Sometimes it's a week, month, year, or 20 years. Because you're on His clock. And you must accept that fact before you go into it. Amen? <laughs> You're on his clock. We also must stand on the promises of God. Prayer is tempered by the scriptures. Standing on scriptural truth often has a deep impact on the power, effectiveness, and content of our prayers. God loves it when we stand on his promises and his word and we persevere through them. There is power in acknowledging God and His Word when we pray. David says this in 2 Samuel 7. Listen, listen to David here. This is a prayer that's recorded in Scripture. Now then, Lord God, the word that you have spoken... David, remember that guy? Yeah, I heard it. You heard it. We on the same page here, Lord, right? About your servant and his house, confirm it forever. And do just as you have spoken, so that your name may be great.
forever by saying, The Lord of armies is the God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, Lord of armies, God of Israel, have given a revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house, God's word. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. God's word. David standing on it in faith. Say, remember that, Lord? You said it. I'm standing. Now then, Lord God, you are God. Notice the humbleness. Notice, notice, the, notice the gratefulness. And your words are truth. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. And now may it please you to bless, your, to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you, Lord God, have spoken. Standing on the rock. Standing on the rock. What's the rock? God's word. The Bible is filled with promises that are true for every believer in here. And you stand on God's word and you speak it back to him. Amen. You get before him when times are going, whatever it is. And you say, Lord, you have promised. I may fall down ten times, but you have promised to pick me up. And I'm standing on the word. You said to come to the throne of grace with all of our needs. I say that to him. That you have promised, Lord. And I'm standing on your word. Pray with faith-filled expectations. Pray expecting to hear from God. Don't, you know what he hates? Well, God, maybe if you just notice me sometime, little old me, maybe sometime, Lord, just maybe, you can help me out here once in a while. No, you come to him saying, Lord, I don't know what the outcome is here, but I'm praying with expectations that my heart will be kept by you in this hour. You pray tempered by faith. And thus we have faith-filled expectations that God will give us an answer to our prayer. James says this in the opening of his epistle. But if any of you lacks wisdom, what does he mean by this? It means something going on that they need some understanding and they need some sort of application to get through. Something's going on. Lord, give me the wisdom, right? Let him ask of God, who gives to all what? And without? And what does the word say next? It will be given to him. But, the holy but, he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, for that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You cannot walk this way and that way, one foot in the world and one foot in the Bible, and expect God's going to answer your prayers. You better get on your knees before Him, humbly, and you go to the Lord the right way or don't go. Because he's not, there are, this sets a precedent that there is a type of prayer to pray where God's going to say, I don't even hear it. Don't ask me for an answer when you come to me like that. That's not my opinion. Well, it might be your opinion, but your opinion is correct. Yes, right. There we go. <laughs> Roll four here is getting some some turbo boost on my side. <laughs> Prayer is a foundation for the church. Here's where we're going to get the kit caboodle, as they say. 
In the second chapter of Acts, if you want to go with me in your Bibles, or I have it on the screen, it is clear that the church was born in a prayer meeting. Then they returned to Sebastian Apartments, I mean uh, Jerusalem, from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Now remember, Jesus had left already. That is Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Sal. Oh, I'm sorry, the period there. All of these were, here it is, all these were continually, what? Before the Holy Spirit came, these folks were in a dining hall. 120 of them huddled together. <clears throat> Not really knowing exactly. They, the Lord said the Holy Spirit's going to come. That's all they got. Okay, what do we do in the meantime? They went to prayer. <clears throat> if you don't know, pray. pray. If you don't know, We're seeing that in this church on many fronts. For Brian, we don't know. So we pray. And we're going to continue to pray because this is a very serious situation. And we need miracles. So we pray. And we expect God to answer in some way. We don't know how. But we expect an answer. I'm going to open the drapes here. The conclusion of Acts chapter 2. After the arrival of the Holy Spirit, a few verses later, right, it should be noted that there were four primary actions taken by the church that established its foundation. Now, we have a lot of books about this stuff, the purpose driven church. <laughs> How about get back to Scripture and read? That's my book I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And it's one page. Get back to Scripture and read. And then do it. <coughs> I'm, I'm, probably just, I, I'm smart like that because I it's not me. I'm a dummy. But where I'm smart is I listen. And I realize I can't improve on what God did. What God did. <laughs> Here's the purpose-driven church. Acts 2 and 42. All the denominations would end if they followed this. They were, say it with me, <laughs> continually devoting yourselves. Say it again. Continually <laughs> devoting themselves. Four things. It's so simple, Matthias can be can pastor a church soon. See, he's got the Holy Ghost hop during worship back there. What were they devoting themselves to? The apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and what makes a successful church in God's eyes? Apostolic doctrine, the scriptures, the gathering of the saints, and fellowship, shared meals and intimacy, and corporate prayer. Folks, a lot of theologians are going to get to heaven with their doctorate degrees and look really dumb. Yeah. When the scripture pops up on the screen, because I believe that God has a screen, it's going to pop up. Guys, see that? It's not rocket science. Doctrine. Fellowship. Shared meals, corporate prayer. When we have our parties, and you know, when all of us went to the O'Hagans on July 4th, and our little meals in the church once in a while, those are amazing times. Even when I go to Mulligan's with George and Ruth, amazing times. <laughs> Especially if they pick up the bill, right? <laughs> That's even better. 
That is the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. Not complicated, is it? We don't need a handbook of catechisms and rules and all this man-made godly goop. Follow the scripture, gather together, share your lives with one another, and pray together. You can't go wrong. Nope. Now, in, in corporate prayer, there is targeted specific requests. He left examples throughout all of his epistle letters. For those of you who were here for Thursday night, we just studied through some of this. In our last chapter of Thessalonians, he opens up with chapter 3. Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it was also with you, and that we will be rescued from troublesome and evil people, for not all have faith. So this is all over scripture examples of this. What I want you to get out of this is Paul gave a detailed request of specifics. He prayed that the word of the Lord would spread rapidly. That means we need, that God doesn't do it automatically, we need to pray it. You want to grow your church? Pray that the word of the Lord would spread rapidly and that it would be glorified. That means people would come to Christ. And he also requested to be rescued from troublesome and evil people. There was persecution. Paul was dealing with false teachers and the religious people, right, that were persecuting him. Specific, detailed prayers. Very important. I challenge you, when you go through the scriptures, when you're in the epistles and you read those opening and closing statements, pay attention to what Paul prays for. Pretty interesting. Peter, John. Very specific things. Yes, no, and not yet. Here's where God is sovereign. He holds to write the answer how he sees fit. And in his time, according to his will, get that straight right off the bat. This is humbling, right? It is a struggle. And many people, God's going to test all of you in this if he hasn't already. You got a word, buddy? Come on up. I love that. I love that. Give me a few minutes. I'll join you. Get several words. I can't tell you, for me personally, how refreshing it is having children around. Yes. 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 All parents do not think, you know, you're, you're sinning by having your little toddler in here. It is no offense to me. Jesus said, bring the little children unto him. I've been in a church, I've, I've heard horror stories where the pastor kicks all the children out and will be raped people if they have their children and they make a peep. That is wicked. But he lost his congregation. No, it's unfortunately not. They sit there like zombies and just obey. Yeah, that's how it should be, but that's not how it is. Yeah, I just hope it. <laughs> Y'all are going to be, we all are going to be tested in this when you don't get an answer for a long period of time. I know a lot of people that have fallen away from the faith because they don't get an answer right away. I know a lot. Well, God can't be real. If God was real, why would, it, why would, he, why would he do this? Maybe they got an answer and didn't listen. Well, that is true. But you stand, you stand in faith. All, other times he answers our prayers in the affirmative exactly how we desire. Perseverance and persistence is especially needed during these times. Job, greatest example in the Bible of this. Satan came against them in every way, physically, spiritually, killed his children, 
That's in the scriptures. Put warts on his flesh. Scales. The man's in agony. Crying out to God as we all would. Put on sackcloth and ashes and sat there before the Lord. And that man never doubted a lick. Not for an iota. He said, nope. He had the friends come and accuse him of sinning too much. He had the terrible wife tell him to curse God and die. He said, nope. Whatever that I'm going through, he did a little woe is me, right? Which is okay. And what happened at the end of the book of Job? How did God answer him? The whirlwind. Finally, after a period of time, the whirlwind came. And the Lord said, stand up, and I'm going to question you like a man. Remember that? And guess what? Even though Job did not sin, and God said, he didn't sin, he went to the friends. Joanne, right? He said, hey, you tree, <laughs> you did not speak right of me or of Job. And the Lord affirmed him. But he dealt with his woe as me for about a whole chapter and a half. <laughs> and he laid the groundwork on me, on the Lord. You are you, you're a man. Put him in his place, right? And then he blessed him because ultimately Job stood before the Lord in agony and never doubted or cursed God. Never said one evil word towards the Lord. And God knew that of his heart. That's why he was chosen in the first place. God made the bet. I tell this to God all the time. You're having it out with Satan. Please not me. <laughs> Second Corinthians 12. Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, he pleaded with the Lord. He went to the Lord in prayer. It, it indicates three times he had a prayer meeting with God. Lord, please take this away. Lord, take away this thorn. Lord, I cannot bear the thorn anymore. Take it away. And God didn't say yes. God didn't say no. He simply said this. When God finally spoke after the third time, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. So in this case, God didn't grant Paul a specific answer. He offered him strengthening grace for in the meantime. And sometimes you're in a situation where it's grace for each day, and that's it. And then you've got to start over the next day. And there is just enough there provided for you to get through each day. Brian and I and Larry had a little conversation about this last week. And Brian was in a place where he already knew. He had the right frame. You can tell he was with the Lord. He was like, one day at a time. One obstacle at a time. God is very much in the process, and he allows trials and struggles of everyday life as a tool to grow us and bond us together, both with him and each other. It is often through this process that we hear and see God in ways we would not have not. It's like a military unit, right? You, they train and train and train and train, and until... They're actually, and Harry will tell you this, in combat experience, it's a whole nother level of putting your training to practice, and you'll see things where you have to grow. You'll see the strengths and the weaknesses. And you talk to combat vets, and there's a bond that forms in their unit 
that is unbreakable. When you have each other's very lives, you're looking out for each other. There's something deeper that happens in their lives. And you see, <clears throat> like if you ever watched Band of Brothers, those guys, every year, from 1946 all the way until they died out, for 70-some years, they would get together once a year and were a part of each other's lives because they endured from training then to D-Day all the way um, to the end of the war. And this is very similar to corporate prayer. There's a bonding that goes together. Prayer is a form of spiritual warfare as well. Remember Daniel? When he, when he didn't get an answer, why didn't he get an answer? The Lord had answered him right away. He had 21 days he didn't get an answer. Because there was a demonic entity that prevented the answer from getting to him. Don't, don't ask me how or why. We just know it is. There was a principality, a demonic principality, that stopped him from getting his answer, and God had to dispatch an archangel to fight this principality, and it took 21 days in the natural for his message to get through. And the angel said, well, God dispatched the answer right away, but the prince of Persia opposed me so that I could not get the answer to you. And God had to send Michael to fight this thing so that that angel could be released to give Daniel the answer. So it's very interesting. Almost done. The results of corporate prayer. Corporate prayer is a calling. It is a form of spiritual warfare that yields results in every way, both in the natural and the supernatural. We are brought together, and when we are in the spirit together, we are powerful in the Lord. Corporate prayer is a necessary action all churches must be established in. Paul said this of Epaphras, who was wrestling in prayer for the church of Coloss. He said, Epaphras is wrestling in prayer for you. You hear that? That you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. Wow. So in other words, to be strong in the Lord, a church, to experience the fullness of God's will, there has to be a war for it in prayer. Some of the things that happen in prayer in Scripture, number one, miracles. Number two, God speaks to people, as we've seen. We are unified in prayer. God's will is made known to us oftentimes in prayer. We access the throne of grace in prayer. Darkness is defeated in prayer. So often we turn to movements and politics and these things to defeat the forces of darkness when we should be praying first. God's kingdom advances by way of prayer. And Jesus modeled this reality for us. Therefore, it is essential for the church to follow this pattern. And here's some of the things that we felt God speaking. And I kind of took notes here of what he laid on my heart during the end of our prayer time on Wednesday night. You know, we have been in a period of extended trials, right? Even Robin had said, man, Satan is really beating up a lot of people right now and standing against this church. I believe that. I believe God has always had a special purpose for this church. And Satan has been opposed to this church for generations. And there have been short moments where the church began to walk in the will of God. 
and Satan came against her. I'm going to be honest here, because I'm warning you right now. Hear me out. Satan is going to try and stop this church. He has already. He will continue to do so. He's very confident that he can split this thing once again. <clears throat> and the one thing that we have is praying outside of the other things. And here is what I feel the Lord has given us through pork. I'll get you in a second. We'll hold that thought. To fulfill the God has a specific will and a vision for this church and this community. And I believe that the walls of this church extend outward. As we know, there's probably many people online around the nation who I'm humbly blown away would look to this ministry for connection. It's already happening. We have been growing in doctrine. We have a reverence for the scriptures here, which is good. We are excelling in fellowship. This is a very loving church. We are very strong like the Thessalonians in loving one another and good deeds. I could put a message on Messenger right now with a need and somebody will take it. I was just looking yesterday and Denise put out a need and I think somebody responded very quickly to Wheat Whack, I think it was. The Lord loves where we're headed there. But we're not there yet. And God is using trials right now to teach us. And now we are learning the power of corporate prayer so that this ministry, Acts chapter 2, 42, will have all four working in unison. It's the four-cylinder engine, right? And I believe that if we follow this biblical pattern, we stay alert, like the scripture says. We stay humble. We stay grateful. We stay strong together, watching over ourselves. I believe that God will move in a way to bring about His will over this body. And that's what we should be most concerned about first, right? Our personal lives, our families, and the body that we belong to. Will you tarry for one hour? And I'm not, I'm not saying necessarily you have to come to Wednesday night prayer, right? But will you tarry for one hour with the Lord? Will you stay awake and keep watch? Will you dedicate some time during your week to tarry with the Lord? To get before Him, and I'm challenging you right now, We need it, and you need it. Amen? Amen. Amen? Margaret. I was going to mention Wednesday night, it was storming. I was coming to the prayer meeting, but it was pouring so hard, I said, wait and see if it lets up, because it usually does. Instead, the lightning struck right in back of my house. It was the biggest explosion I've ever heard. And no fear, I just said, God show me what to do. So I went in the back, of course, in the pouring rain, making sure there was no fire along with the, because I don't know what exploded. But long story short, God gave me his peace. And I sat outside because, of course, it's too hot inside. Had to be there for the power of people. And it took them two and a half hours. But God, God is amazing. 
So I sat outside because it was cooler. You know, after this yep. storm, it's usually cooler. And I had my bug spray, and it was peace. And it's amazing how God has built that up in me. It's His Spirit. We just have, there's certain things we got to go through. And just Amen. keep pushing through. Keep pushing through. Yeah. Um, we're going to close with prayer in a second. Thank you for being here and for your support. Um, Lord, we just thank you for this time together. I ask that you would imprint on our hearts the need for prayer, the call to prayer. Lord, that instead of looking outwardly to things, we would look inwardly for all the things going on around us and in the world that we begin to intercede and pray. Lord, we don't want to look for salvation or for an answer to prayer or anywhere else but to you, Lord. Lord, we come to you humbly and we honor you, Lord. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts and our minds. Continue to guide us. Help us to keep watch. Lord, I pray that you would keep the enemy away from this place, that you would protect us, Lord. Father, we continue to pray for those who are sick, for Brian, for Mark's sister, for all those who are mentioned today in cancer battles and all kinds of situations going on. Lord, I pray for Henrietta that she would have a safe journey back to Europe, that you continue to move on her life and watch over her and protect her and continue to move on her life. We're grateful to get to meet her. And we pray for her. We pray for Gabby on the mission field. Lord, that you continue to watch over her and give her opportunity to minister to you, opportunity to grow in your word and fellowship. We thank you for her service to the kingdom. And Lord, continue to guide us in our lives as we go into a new week, that we would see opportunity that you have for us each and every day. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you all.